Hello and welcome to a discussion about the Star of Bethlehem. In this lecture, we're going to go over theories people have about the Star of Bethlehem, possible objects that could explain what the Star of Bethlehem was, and then we're going to also take a sort of a scriptural viewpoint, looking at the evidence that's provided in the book of Matthew, and try to use it to sift through these theories to determine which of them might be, might be consistent with what we read about in the Bible. So before we go into the theories about what the Star of Bethlehem could be, let's examine the scripture and see what exactly was said about it. This scripture represents sort of the only data that we have about the Star of Bethlehem because, this, because the Star of Bethlehem isn't recorded in any other work that we know of um, from this time period. So from Matthew chapter 2 verses 1 to 3, it says that now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, an important point to look at in these first three verses is that there's no mention that it's a bright star. So this could explain why it might have escaped the notice of uh, people around the world. They simply say that it is a star that has appeared and, and that, they came, that they assumed that the appearance of this star had something to do with the um, birth of a king. So moving on, in chapter 2, verse 8, uh, we find that Herod sent them to Bethlehem. So they've come to Herod. And it said in the intervening text that Herod's uh, scribes tell him that the, uh, the, the, the Christ or the Savior is supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So he directs them to Bethlehem, which is not that far away. It's within walking distance, so certainly within a day's walk. So he said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Now, that isn't exactly what Herod meant to do, but he did want to know if there was a king born because Herod is king and he's not going to broke any, you know, challenge to his rule. Moving on to chapter two, verse nine. When they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, the significance of this is that now just going back to the previous passage real quick i was wanting to establish and the reason why i included it is herod herod's palace is in jerusalem bethlehem is a certain distance away so we so the importance of the previous passage how it relates to chapter 2 verse 9 is that these wise men walk from jerusalem to bethlehem and as they do the star that was before them on their way moves in the sky apparently now i'm not saying it actually moves i'm saying it apparently moves at least to their to their eyes so that it was before them when they started walking and it's over them when they arrive at bethlehem now the two possibilities are the star moved or their movement on the earth caused them to perceive the star from a different angle so that it appeared in a different place in the sky when they um, arrived in Bethlehem. Now what I'm showing you here is a Google Maps uh, display of a route from Herod's palace to the Church of the Nativity, presumably where Jesus was born. And it indicates that the distance is about uh, just under nine kilometers, between 8.5 to nine kilometers. So now I'm gonna say it's probably the crow flies closer to eight kilometers. So, and that's important because the star appeared to move and the, as they walked and then it stopped moving when they stopped walking. Conceivably, it was never actually moving. And one might assume that their motion, uh, their, their, their travel over the earth caused them to uh, observe the star from a different angle. 
And this is, so we're going to start looking at what this angle is, the size of it, and what sort of the limit of this angle could be to try to establish where in the heavens the star could be, probably was, from an altitude standpoint. So it's important to establish, if we're going to do that, we're going to use trigonometry. And if we're going to use trigonometry, we have to, we have to know at least one side of a triangle and an angle in the triangle if we're going to establish uh, the, the uh, links of the other sides. And this route from Jerusalem to Bethlehem gives us approximately one side of the triangle. So if the, if the star of Bethlehem is, if its position can be triangulated, like I said, we're going to need to know one side of the triangle, which we establish is uh, the length from uh, we're going to we're going to use a triangle to establish the position. We need to know one side of that triangle, which is about eight kilometers from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. We're also going to need to know an angle, and so the, the biblical text doesn't really tell us that angle. It tells us that distance they walk, but it doesn't tell us the angle through which the star moved in the sky as they traveled from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. However we can come up with the smallest angle it could have been. And you'll see in a moment why knowing the smallest angle is helpful because it will end up bounding the maximum height the star is above the surface of the earth. So how do we bound the smallest angle? Or how do we determine the smallest angle it could have been? Well, the key is that they perceived the star moved. It was before them when they started walking. It was over them when they stopped walking. And so it had to have moved a, through an angle that was larger than the minimum resolution or minimum angular resolution of the human eye, which is reported in this textbook of ophthalmology to be about one arc minute. So an arc minute is about 1 60th of a degree, and a degree is 1 360th of a, uh, of a circle. So you can, it's a very small angle but it had, the angle couldn't have been any smaller than that. If it were, as you've seen on the graphs here, uh, if two, so what, these graph, what this graph represents, it's a sort of a, a graph that's presented to explain the resolution of the human eye and, and what, or the resolution of an optical system. And what it, what it shows you is if you can see the two objects are separate objects, then you, those objects are separated in an angle by greater than one arc minute. If the two objects are merged to where you can just barely tell that they're two separate objects, then the objects are separated by almost exactly one arc minute. But if the objects are separated by a, an angular distance that's less than an arc minute, you get the last graph on the bottom where you, it looks like one object. Those, that's really two objects, but your eye can't perceive it's two objects because the, the separation between them in angle is smaller than the, the minimum angle that the eye can resolve. And so what I'm proposing is that we set the angle that the star moved to at least be one arc minute because if it moved any less than that while they were walking, they couldn't have told the, they couldn't even told they couldn't have even perceived that it moved at all because it would be, appear to be in the exact same place in the sky because their eyes would be unable to perceive that it that it changed position because because of the minimum angular resolution of the eye so here's where we put what we know about this triangle we're trying to form we know that the Ang angle that they viewed it had to be that the, the angle with, with, with which they through which they perceived that the star moved had to be greater than one arc minute. So that's theta in this graph here on the right. And we know that they traveled eight kilometers. So that's the side of the, that triangle there below. Now it's also the side of the, of the, the top side of the triangle above that contains the angle theta. So essentially, we know one side of the triangle and we know one angle potentially that it had to be at least that angle and it could have been bigger. So 
So now we, the other key piece of evidence that came from scripture is that the star stood over where the child lay. So therefore, it's presumably the star wasn't moving. It was only moving while they were walking. And it did stop moving when they stopped walking. So if, there, if it was there walking eight kilometers from Jerusalem to Bethlehem that caused it to appear to move. And so we can actually build a triangle and now we can use trigonometry to analyze it. So if we're going to use trigonometry, we have to uh, reacquaint ourselves with angles and what they mean. So angles, just to explain what an angle is, if my, all my talk of angles up till now has been somewhat um, confusing, angles and what an angle tells you effectively is how far around a circle um, you're, you're rotating. So if, if you're, if you're looking, say, along the bottom blue, uh, purple line that I've drawn in this circle, and you change the direction you look through an angle of theta, that's what that Greek symbol is there, now you're looking at a different point in the circle. If you change your angle, the angle through which you're looking by 360 degrees, it means you go all the way around the circle. So it turns out one degree is one three three hundred and sixtieth around this circle. So if you change the direction you're looking from the center, um, as you look at different points in this uh, along this edge of the circle, you know from the, from the center, if you change it one three hundred sixtieth of the whole trip around the circle, that's one degree. So that's and then if you and it turns out the arc minute we're talking about is one sixtieth of that degree, which is almost like one almost 20 thousandth of a whole trip around the circle. So it's a very small angle. Our eyes are really amazing. They can actually see very fine details. And so uh, this, this minimum angle though, take, you know, we don't know what angle through which the star moved while they were walking. The, the text doesn't say, but we know the angle had to be big enough for them to perceive it. So it had to be at least that big. And so that's essentially what this angle means is it, it, it's uh, the, the change in the direction they looked um, as they traveled is the, uh, or change in the, yeah, in the direction is, can be measured with an angle. And that's how uh, we're going to, with this, this sort of this notion of angular measurement is going to be critical to our analysis of determining what the star of Bethlehem could have been. Now we're actually going to do the math involved with figuring out how high the Star of Bethlehem could have been above the surface of the Earth. And before we begin doing the math, doing the trigonometry, we're going to look at what would happen if the angle were larger than the minimum angle um, through which the star could have moved. So I have two, two graphs here. On the, the, the graph on the left shows a taller rectangle, and there you have an eight kilometer base, and then the star is sort of at the top. And so you imagine when they are looking up at it from Jerusalem, they see it before them. And then they move, they, as they move, walk the eight kilometers along the bottom, they, the, they, when, they get to the, uh, when they get to Bethlehem, the star is directly over them. Now, if that angle were bigger than the minimum angle, then what would that mean? Well, they still walked eight kilometers. That doesn't change. But if the angle gets larger, so I drew a larger angle there on the second graph, the star would have to be lower. So the, the bigger the angle that through which the star moves across the sky as they walk from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the lower the star of Bethlehem would have to be um, to, for, for it to be overhead when they get to Bethlehem. So by using the minimum angle, we're actually coming up with what they call an upper bound on the height of the star of Bethlehem. And that upper bound is gonna be important in our discussion moving forward because if we know the highest the star could be, we could rule out lots of things in that appear in the heavens because they may, they're probably just too far away for this for to behave the way the star of Bethlehem did as it's described in the scripture. Now, the trigonometry is pretty simple. Turns out the tangent of the angle theta is equal to the opposite side 
over the adjacent side. The adjacent side is the height of the star. The opposite side of this triangle that has theta in it is the eight kilometer side. So it's the opposite side over the adjacent side or the 8,000 meter side, which is what eight kilometers is over the height. And by taking the uh, tangent of theta, um, which is one arc minute, we find that that is 2.9 times 10 to the minus fourth and solving for h. So we multiply both sides of the equation by h and then divide both sides by 2.9 times 10 to the minus four. And we get 2,760 kilometers. And so that is the maximum height the star could be. You remember if the angle were larger, the, um, then the, the larger that angle is, the bigger the, the number would be, um, the 2.9 times 10 to the minus fourth would be. So imagine the number were 2.9 times 10 to the third. Well, the height, the max height wouldn't be 2,760 kilometers anymore. It would be 276 kilometers because the bigger the number is on the right, the smaller the max height is. And the bigger the number is on the right is, is related to the larger angle. So by using the minimum angle, we, we ba upper bound this height at 2,760 kilometers. That sounds pretty high, but you'll see in a moment when we talk about the heavens and the things in the heavens, that that isn't very high at all. So next we're going to uh, start entertaining some hypotheses. We have some data about the star of Bethlehem provided by scripture. It's an object in the sky that appeared and then presumably it disappeared, although we're not sure about that. It doesn't really say. We only know that it appeared, so it wasn't always there. We also know that it moved in a certain way as to using our trigono trigonometry analysis. It couldn't have been more than 2,760 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And so we're going to look at a bunch of theories that people have thrown out there and see how that they conform to this data that we have from Scripture. Um, first off, we're going to entertain the hypothesis that it was a star, or you know, and uh, perhaps a, a star, an exploding star. We'll see. Um, there's there's many hypotheses that, about it being a kind of special star that have been thrown out there that we'll discuss. Um, people have also discussed the possibility that it was a planet or a conjunction of planets, and that's why it sort of wasn't seen and then it appeared because it became brighter. Uh, the other idea is it could have been a comet, and comets certainly aren't always there, and they do appear. Uh, another kind of the object that appears and uh, was, isn't always there, but can become brighter temporarily is an asteroid, which is kind of like a comet, but it's a little bit different in, in some ways. Um, another possibility, it was something that was orbiting the Earth, and that makes it a satellite. So we'll entertain that possibility We'll look into the possibility that we'll discuss the possibility that it was a balloon. Uh, this may be the star of Bethlehem wasn't a natural occurring thing, but something built by humans. So we'll look at the possibility that it was a balloon or a kite. We're not going to look at the possibility that it was an airplane because airplanes weren't invented uh, or uh, other man-made things. And we say satellite, there are, you know, you don't have to be, a, not all satellites are man-made. Um, so we're going to look at a combination of natural and man-made phenomena that could explain the um, appearance of the star of Bethlehem and satisfy uh, what it, uh, you know, the observations of it. So one theory is that star, the star of Bethlehem could have been a, a star. Uh, we, what we know about stars is they are balls of hydrogen gas that are large enough so that the, their gravity holds them together. Essentially, there's enough mass to so that the mass of the object keeps them from flying apart. And, of course, when all that material gets forced together very strongly, you can get nuclear fusion going, which, which is what creates the heat in the star. They come in different sizes and colors, which are dependent on their temperature. And after burning a long time, they often explode in what's called a nova or supernova. And depending, which, and that whether the star goes nova or supernova depends on the size of the star. 
Now, during this explosion, they get a lot brighter and a lot hotter, or a lot larger, temporarily, and they might appear in the sky where there didn't appear to be a star before. So that certainly fits the first um, uh, sort of observation from Scripture about the Star of Bethlehem. It was an object that appeared that wasn't there before. So a few more interesting things about stars, since, since we're interested in science um, and we're talking about stars. Uh, the c stars have colors, and so it isn't mentioned in Scripture what color the Star of Bethlehem was, but uh, the actual color of a star depends very much on its temperature. So uh, we say that uh, a star like our sun has a temperature between 5,500 and 6,000 degrees Kelvin, where the degree Kelvin is a me measurement of temperature a lot like a degree Celsius or Fahrenheit, a degree Fahrenheit for that matter, but it's much more, Kelvin, this Kelvin scale is much more related to the, to the Celsius scale. Whereas if you take the temperature of, of um, an object uh, in its degree Celsius and add 273 to it, you get its temperature in the Kelvin scale. And so when an object has zero, is at zero degrees Kelvin, it's at absolute zero and can't get any, there's nothing colder than that. And so the other interesting thing about the stars is that that uh, they're, they are a certain distance from the Earth. And it turns out Proxima Centauri is an M-type spectral star, so it's a cool star compared to our Sun. And it's the closest star that we know of to our Sun. And it's even thought to have planets. But its distance from Earth is over four light years, which is trillions and trillions of miles away, much higher than 2,000 uh, 760 kilometers. So the idea that the star of Bethlehem was some sort of star or supernova would not fit the observations that we made uh, about it. So in essence, we could sort of rule out that the star of Bethlehem was a star or an exploding star or anything like that. So the star theories all sort of hinge on that the star of Bethlehem was some sort of exploding star because it wasn't observed before and then it became observable. And also people believe that it was a bright star, even though the gospel doesn't mention that it was being exceptionally bright. So although a nova, nova or supernova could occur from a star that was not visible from Earth normally but be, and then became visible during the explosion, um, the biggest problem, as I said before, was that, uh, and the, why none of the star theories or nova theories or supernova theories hold, is that we calculated, based on the of observations from Scripture, that the star couldn't have been higher than 2,760 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And even Proxima Centauri, as we said before, uh, the closest star to Earth, is trillions of kilometers away. So it, there's just no way that, as I said before, the star could be the star of Bethlehem. So if the, Beth the star of Bethlehem wasn't a star, what was it? So we can eliminate stars from the list of possible hypotheses. Next thing we're going to consider are planets. Could a planet or a conjunction of planets have been the, th the star, the, the bright light, that people saw in the east that they that are they associate with the star of Bethlehem, and uh, of course planets people would normally have seen all the time, but a conjunction of planets would be a new event that might be mistaken potentially for a new brighter object. So the Earth isn't the only planet orbiting the sun. There are other bodies, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, are like the Earth, and they're small, stony, rocky worlds. And then you've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, which are larger gas uh, planets that, that are mostly made out of gas and, and may or may not have solid surfaces. So 
these planets uh, all orbit the sun and con conceivably they are things that people can see in the sky they look like stars uh, but they are always there so it makes one wonder why uh, an ancient astronomer might think that there's a new star showing up uh, that's associated with a planet that's always been there before. Now, some of the planets aren't very visible from Earth, and that would be Uranus and Neptune. Uh, they're difficult to see, especially Neptune. So perhaps if Neptune and Uranus were in conjunction somehow, then uh, they would appear as a brighter object. So this is a table of sizes of planets and their distances from the sun. You can see that Mercury is about 5,000 kilometers, just under 5,000 kilometers, which is about 3,000 meters or 3,000 miles across. Mars and Earth are very much uh, the same, close to the same size, being about 8,000 miles across or 12,000 kilometers. Um, that's Venus and Earth, I should say. Mars is bigger than Mercury, but smaller than the Earth. And... Um, and then you can see Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all much larger than the Earth. Neptune being four times bigger than the Earth, and all the other gas giants being even larger than that. So they are immense in size. Could any of them have been the star of Bethlehem? Well, let's, let's look at their distances from the sun to help figure that out. Um, you can see that Mercury is the closest star to the sun, I mean, closest planet to the sun. But it's the further, it's not the closest planet to Earth. Uh, if you, uh, Mercury at its closest approach to Earth, to calculate that, you would take 149,600,000 miles, which is Earth's distance from the Sun, and subtract 57,900,000 kilometers. And uh, so 149,600,000 kilometers minus 57,900,000 would be somewhere in the neighborhood of um, nine, around 900 million kilometers away. Now, Venus is closer. In fact, it is the closest planet to Earth. Uh, and when at its closest approach, it's about 39 million kilometers, but still that's way more than the 2,760 kilometers uh, that we calculated is the furthest distance the star of Bethlehem could possibly be from the Earth surface. So none of these planets or conjunctions of them could possibly be, have been the star of Bethlehem. So that rules out the star of Bethlehem. I mean, the, the star that the star of Bethlehem could possibly be in a planet. What about a comet, though? Comets are uh, interesting. People get excited to see them, and then they certainly uh, excited ancient peoples. Could a comet have been the star of Bethlehem? Well, it turns out comets are a lot like planets, except they're much smaller usually and have more irregular orbits. They do, uh, where planets move in ellip ellipses around the sun that are fairly circular, comets tend to work, move in ellipses that are much more elliptical and less circular. They tend to be composed of ice and are known for the, their tails, which are basically ice evaporating uh, away from the surface as the comets get close to the sun. So you can see their tails when they, when they approach the inner solar system. Now, in theory, comets could get very close to Earth. And although there's not any record of them getting within 2,760 kilometers, it would be not impossible that one could. It would be nearly slamming into the surface of the Earth, which would be an event that would be visible to people all over the globe. And it's been pointed out that Chinese astronomers during the time of Jesus were very observant and wrote their observations down. So if a comet had been the culprit, um, it would have had to graze the Earth. And here's the thing. Anything approaching that closely uh, wouldn't be standing still in the sky. It would be moving overhead like a meteor, uh, which we'll address um, more, uh, sort of in more detail on some, when we go into, start looking at asteroids and satellites. So uh, it's probably um, not a comet. Now, comets are a lot like asteroids. 
uh, or asteroids are a lot like comets and planets, except asteroids are smaller than planets and usually have more regular orbits than comets. So they move like planets, uh, but they are more the size of, um, of comets. And what you're seeing here in this video is this is an asteroid that came very close to Earth and it, um, it came close enough to where it was near the orbit of the geosynchronous orbit distance. And so it did stay still in the sky, but to do so, it was about 36,000 kilometers away from Earth, way over the 2,760 that would be the max height of the Star of Bethlehem. So because asteroids um, generally, although they can slam into the surface of the Earth, and so they can get very close, again, there was no record of, uh, of this. Now, asteroids being much smaller, that could have escaped the notice of uh, Chinese astronomers. However, for an asteroid to stay stationary, like the one I showed you in the video a moment ago over the surface of the Earth, it would have to be at the geosynchronous orbit distance, which is about 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, way over the 2,760 kilometers. If an asteroid moves closer than that, it, it doesn't appear to stay stationary in the sky. It, in fact, uh, would move very quickly across the sky like a meteor, which we'll talk about again, more so, more again in a moment. So we've kind of ruled out comets and asteroids, could the uh, star of Bethlehem been a satellite? So satellites are anybody that orbits uh, another, another object in space. For Earth, satellites are things like the moon, which orbit the Earth, but are way too large to be the star of Bethlehem. So Earth only has the one natural satellite now that we know of, but in theory, it could have captured an asteroid at some point, which would appear as like a new star appearing in the heavens. Um, however, to, for it to stay stationary in the sky, like, the, like on the video here, so that's, that star is staying stationary in the sky, it would have to be orbiting at 36,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Now that other bright object that you see moving through quickly there, that's a meteor. That's how an object would appear that, move, that is further away from the uh, that is closer to the Earth. Uh, so if, if uh, satellites that are lower in low Earth orbit would appear to be um, uh, would appear to be uh, moving very quickly and wouldn't stay stationary. So we can rule out satellites as well. Now if you're looking for an object that is that would could stay stationary over the surface of the Earth, but would be and would be below not a geosynchronous orbit, which is 36,600 kilometers away from the surface, but below that, below the 2,760 kilometers, one might consider balloons as being a possibility. Balloons could, in theory, carry a, a, a fire. In fact, hot air balloons do have fires so that they can uh, heat air and rise. Uh, now, no balloon has ever been above 100 kilometers, so in theory, the um, if the Star of Bethlehem had been some sort of man-made balloon um, sporting a fire uh, for heat, um, then uh, it would never, it wouldn't have possibly really have been over a hundred kilometers high, which is about the edge of space. Uh, but uh, balloons are a candidate because they can appear to hover over a fixed point of the Earth, and uh, especially if they're tethered like a kite. The long rope, they could just stay over the same point, and people might mistake them for a star. And on top of that, Chinese astronomers, being as low as the balloon would be, because it really couldn't go into space, um, being at that altitude, it'd be hard for Chinese astronomers to visit, to view it, who are way over in the east, thousands of kilometers to the east. So it's unlikely they would see anything like that. And that would explain why uh, people uh, would have seen the star of Bethlehem, and but not register. But you know, people who are local to the Middle East might have seen it if it were a, a very high balloon. But 
people in China wouldn't know. It explains why Chinese astronomers didn't see the star of Bethlehem. So people have built all kinds of balloons that achieve the very high altitudes, um, dirigibles, weather balloons, and so forth. But the first known uh, balloon launch uh, by a human being was uh, was P was uh, De Rosier, a scientist uh, who launched the first hot air balloon in 1783, which is thousands of years later than when the Star of Bethlehem was observed. So it's unlikely the Star of Bethlehem was a balloon. So striking balloons off the list, that just leaves kites. Could the Star of Bethlehem been um, a, a, a kite that was mistaken for a star somehow? So kites are man-made objects that really never go anywhere near the 2,760 kilometers, which is sort of the max height the Star of Bethlehem could have been. That's because they float on the air and there's really no air above 100 kilometers, which is the edge of space. In fact, the highest kite's ever really been flown is, a, is, a, is just a few kilometers high. Kites do have the property that they, when flying, could appear to hover over a fixed point in the earth. And uh, people have built all kinds of kites that have gotten quite high and, and, and if they had a light source on them, they could in theory be mistaken for a star. However, they would appear to move around somewhat erratically depending on the winds. Uh, although if the winds were very steady, uh, the kite would be very steady as well. Now, in uh, and the, first kite, the first kites were flown in China um, and they were an invention that's claimed by the 5th century BC Chinese philosopher Mosey. So in theory, humans, unlike the balloon, which didn't fly until the 1700s, kites were being flown before the birth of Jesus. So could the, uh, could the star of Bethlehem been a, have been a kite? We really can't rule that out. It is possible somebody built a kite and flew it above Bethlehem and flew it high enough so people uh, who lived to the east would have seen it. We don't know how far away the, um, the Magi were coming from, so, but it, certainly the kites weren't fl being flown high enough to be seen from China. So once again, it would be explained, it would explain why if the Star of Bethlehem were a kite, uh, why uh, they wouldn't have seen it. Now, this would be quite an elaborate uh, operation to fly a light source that high. I mean, the, with the winds aloft and everything, it would be hard to keep anything lit that high up. But so we can't rule it out. And in fact, that is sort of the beauty of the conclusions that we we're going to, that we, we reached at is that the star of Bethlehem really isn't anything that anybody has hypothesized could be the star of Bethlehem. The kite theory isn't anyone that I've seen uh, anybody else propose. And although I'm proposing it here, I don't really believe the star of Bethlehem was a kite. It, it's, uh, uh, it seems extremely unlikely. However, uh, if the star of Bethlehem wasn't a kite, what was it? So it may be the most logical and practical explanation given, given the, uh, the facts at hand. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, examine, give you, the students, a chance to examine these possibilities through some experiments. So here's some experiments that we're going to have uh, uh, available uh, as in sort of video format so that you get these descriptions of the experimental procedure and that you can do the ideas, you can do them yourself. We're going to have you measure the height of an object without the use of a ruler, which is sort, sort of how we're measuring the maximum height that the Star of Bethlehem could have. We're going to use angles and trigonometry. And then another, so that's something you can do in your home. Uh, another experiment we're going to show you how to do in a video is uh, using a telescope and with an attached uh, phone camera, how to take a video of a star and determine how it moves to the sky. So you can see for it yourself that stars don't stay over one fixed point on the earth. Uh, they move, they, the stars themselves actually move. In fact, they go all the way around the earth every night. 
you're also going to have the opportunity to take a video of a planet. Uh, so you can see yourself that the planets move as well, and they don't stay fixed over one point uh, on the Earth and determine how they move through the sky. So these experiments are designed to help you understand why a lot of the theories about the star of Bethlehem, Bethlehem probably aren't true, and uh, or they certainly don't match the description that we see in, in scripture, which is a first-hand account by the people who saw it, which is the best evidence we have of the phenomenon. Ultimately, none of the theories that I put forward in this video are extremely compelling and can be proven to be the star of Bethlehem. And it's like so many things that are involved in, in religion and, uh, the, and the teachings of Jesus, for you to, believe, for you to come to conclu a conclusion yourself about the star of Bethlehem, you have to have faith. You have to have, first of all, this entire discussion was completely motivated by the idea that we can trust what's in Scripture. If you don't trust what's in Scripture, that you don't believe that the Bible is true, then nothing that I presented here is going to hold any, um, any sway or have any um, pull with you. Now, if you do believe that the Bible is true, then what was the Star of Bethlehem? Well, it could be a kite, or it could be an angel. And there, the account also includes uh, angels uh, visiting shepherds and so forth. And certainly, from what we, you know, is told in the Bible about angels, they certainly could be, one of them could have been the Star of Bethlehem. They certainly can fly. They are described as uh, beings of light and that they, they could be seen potentially very far away. But they would not have been flying any more, any higher than 2,170 kilometers. Otherwise, um, they themselves, or would, at least the observations of them, wouldn't be consistent with what, we, with what we see in the book of Matthew. And that is actually my, uh, my belief, not that I have any proof of it, but is that the star of Bethlehem was an angel who heralded the greatest event in human history by providing a light that brought uh, scientific observers, the scientists of our, their day, the, the wise men, to come and make this testimony, to give this account, so that scientists of the future can, uh, can study it and uh, draw inspiration uh, by using the, the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us to analyze and to learn and to to uh, to uh, make determinations about the world around us from our knowledge and so that's where we are um, in the end anything you believe about the star of bethlehem is going to require faith 